This story will cover from then to now and next, all about change, how to turn losers into winners. This was filmed back in 1993. It's turned out to be a classic and important record of a human and wildlife community in a changing world. We'll update the situation for the local people and the crowned or crested cranes whose numbers have changed and are changing. Ian McShane starts telling the story which will continue in two parts, both featuring the symbolic crested crowned crane. And in part two, a remarkable white woman with a tragic ending. The local man's name is Maurice Wanjala, and he'll be joined by a young biologist. The Wanjala family live in a typical African village in northern Kenya. But the father, Maurice Wanjala, is atypical. He has plans to change this landscape, to rearrange the trees, and to help one of Africa's most dramatic creatures. But it won't be easy. The crowned crane is having a difficult time. Though many Kenyans like the bird, they may unwittingly be threatening its future. Its survival is on the line. Will Morris Wangjala and his friends be able to save the Queen of the Marsh? This is the place with the problem, the home of the queen and her mate. It may not look much like a palace, but it's one of the most precious places in Kenya. It's called Saiwa, and it's tiny. Every morning the cranes leave Saiwa swamp. They fly a short distance to a very different kind of place. Below them they see the edge of their home, then a great expanse of tightly farmed maize, the staple diet of Kenya's burgeoning population, of which Morris Wangjala will turn out to be a key figure. These fields of grass and maize at this time form the dance floor for the courting royal couple. They'll stop soon, for the main reason that they've come here, to feed. Though they must have the nightly security of the swamp, they also need the farmland, and in these fields at least, they get on well with the people and their cattle. Mostly they eat seeds, roots, insects, and other small animals. 
They rest in each other's shadow during the heat of the day, but when they've eaten enough or the right time comes, they will return to the safety of their Saiwa roost. As our pair drop in over the swamp's lifeline, the river, they re-enter a very different world. Wide open views here. Hidden in the dense vegetation, they feel safe. Safe enough to start a nest. It should be safe, as part of Saiwa is a national park, one of Kenya's smallest and it's a special refuge for the crown crane and a strange antelope called the Sitatunga. There are pairs of them throughout the narrow swamp. Their territories, which the males mark, are composed of a tricky mixture of mud, floating vegetation and open water. The hooves are splayed into two so they can get around on this unstable surface. These two Saiwa specialities, the Sitatunga and the Crown Crane, peer at each other through the reeds. And sometimes they meet. Along this fragment of the original, much larger wetland are bits of the old forest. Farms have long since displaced most of the monkeys in their home, so now Saiwa is a valuable refuge for many species. Including the shy otter, with of course the famous cranes. One bird in particular would seem safe here as she approaches her nest ever so carefully, so well hidden in the reeds.
But that safety is mistaken. This place is being invaded. And the crane's chances of rearing a family may be slim. From all directions comes disturbance, heard, half seen, and usually unintended. But it's enough to scare the shy queen of the marsh and her mate who's trying to guard her. The mate goes to investigate. As the day heats up, people stop working in the swamp and leave the cranes to some peace and quiet. Not that they realize there was a nest there. But this time, these people are on a very different kind of visit. They found a special tree called a waterberry tree and a suitable patch of mud nearby. With some spikes of grass, he copies the head of the crown crane. The swamp is to become an important location for an unusual ceremony. Young boys are daubed with mud before being circumcised. By putting grass on top, the villagers imitate the crown of the crane, and so they integrate the symbol of the marsh with their local culture. Though many of the people who live near the marsh don't realize what impact they have on it and the cranes, there are now plans to try and improve the situation. The Worldwide Fund for Nature is supporting a pioneering scheme to make the best possible use of the marsh for the benefit of both the people and the wildlife. Much is often said about these kinds of schemes, but this is a real chance to put words into action. And they must get on with it. Population pressure increases every day, and some of the damage being done to the swamp, like drainage, may be difficult to change back later. Lined by strips of forest which provide wood, the swamp offers a whole mix of potential uses. Of course, the key ingredient is clean water, something that is becoming more and more important around the world, whether it be in the cities of Europe or the densely farmed areas around Siwa Swamp. It certainly is important to the cranes, 
Without it, the future of their kind will be at risk. Only cows, but this is a sensitive time. The farmer is not just cutting reeds for thatch, although the swamp can supply that if it's managed properly. No, it's for an interesting experiment to see how his cows respond to various forms of fodder from the swamp. It turns out that some plants go down very well and so the swamp's value is raised a bit more. There's also progress back at the nest. In the past, perhaps the river was taken for granted. It rose and fell with the seasons, but it was always there, flowing quietly through the swamp. But now there are many changes along its course, and as with all rivers, it's a common link where upstream affects the downstream. The flow, the supply, and the quality of water can affect the food of the people. Here they're turning vegetation into fish, a popular tasty species called tilapia. But the fish farm will only succeed if the water's right. Then you have to catch those fish, which involves the cost of nets, how to use them, and a management plan for the future. Cecilia Gichuki, along with Morris Wanchala, is the driving force behind all this. And it so happens that Cecilia's husband, Nathan, wrote up his bird research at Cambridge University on appropriately crowned cranes. He studied them here at Saiwa. There's a second chick now. She'll eat the eggshell, a good example of recycling. And it also removes a possible clue to predators as to where the chicks are. But they won't be here for long. They're born to go, albeit somewhat unsteadily. But there's steady progress with Morris Wanchala's project. At the tree nursery, a wide range of species is being cultivated, 
a mixture of fast-growing foreign kinds and slower-growing native species. We are planning to do uh, survey. Morris and Cecilia discuss the merits and problems of both. The fast growers provide quick results and take the pressure off the native forest, but some may damage the soil. Native trees are preferable, but with a fast growing human population, to whom the future is far away, those slower trees are a difficult investment. The crane's investment in their future, partly dependent on the success of Morris Wangjala's team, now consists of two shaky chicks and one egg. And that unhatched egg poses a problem. At least the part of Siwa that is one of Kenya's smallest national parks should provide protection for the cranes. Tourists come here to see the cranes in that special swamp antelope, the Sitatunga. They provide income, some of which ideally should reach the local people. Otherwise, their support for the park will be reduced, and without money coming in, the park cannot be maintained. Important when it involves the safety of those essential viewing platforms. But even with this kind of view, it's not easy to see the secret cranes. She still has a problem. Not just wandering goats that may eat their way into her protective screen of reeds. Not the second chick which is still finding its feet. Nor the boy who's lost the goats. It's the third egg, still unhatched. Should she stay with it or leave the nest to look after the two chicks? Probably the right decision is the egg may well have been infertile. The de Brazza's monkey, another rarity, and therefore an excellent subject for the painting, to go alongside the Sitatunga and the crowned crane. Morris and his team are getting ready for an event that they hope will draw attention to their project. They need more local support and more money from outside. Their project is not just a one-off. Hopefully, if it works out, it will be seen as a good example of what can be done by local people anywhere. A symbiosis of humans and nature living together, long term. term means him and him will they care about cranes and their home they'll all need the swamp that's for sure
So far, so good. The chicks are growing well. Their sanctuary is still safe. Morris and the choir are trying to keep it that way with a celebration of song and dance. A crane dance. Sort of. Cranes are now back to the old routine, the dance routine, and flying into the fields in the morning and dispersing in the afternoon. Still there, beyond the fields, is the precious kingdom of the two crowned cranes in a marsh fit for a queen. That was the story so far, from way back in 1993. It may turn out to be a classic archive of the place, its people and its wildlife. See part two for an update, involving a young African biologist and more about Maurice Wanjala. We have my friend here, the crested crane, and uh, it goes on turning life. The crested crane is a good wetland indicator, such that where the cranes exist, there is life. And a remarkable white woman whose life came to a tragic end. There is death too, for a cause.